Hey everybody, this is James Pelton. I hope you are having a wonderful Wednesday. Um, this is not my normal location. I couldn't get my camera to work on my main uh, my main setup, so you're going to have to just deal with this. But we're going to be having mostly Will talk today anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so what I need from you guys is please hit the like button as we're getting started here. Um, Will, I'll let him introduce himself, but uh, a couple things that he's really helped me out with. Um, he's helped me out tremendously on the tax side of things. He's very creative when it comes to um, different tax strategies and different ways to get around taxes. And um, I will say he's just been very helpful in connecting me to the right people. Um, I'll, I'll just say this. One of the connections that Will has put me in touch with, I went from uh, owing six, six figures in taxes to owing zero in taxes for 2022. Okay, so... It's worked out very well uh, for me. So uh, you can talk more about that. But the real reason he's on today is I would like him to talk and uh, about his whole life insurance strategy for investing and just kind of explain what that entails, who it's meant for, who can use it. And then if this is something that you guys are interested in, you're welcome to set up a call with him and kind of get going on that. So please hit like. If you have questions as we're going, please ask those. Appreciate it. So, Will, thank you for hopping on today. Appreciate it very much. I know you're a busy guy. Um, could you start out by introducing yourself a little bit, and then we'll get get rolling? Yeah, thanks, James, for having me. Uh, excited to be here and uh, connecting with your audience a little bit. I've uh, enjoyed your videos for uh, quite a while now, so glad to now be a part of one of them. Uh, again, Will Duffy here. Um, I... Uh, I'm kind of based out of two locations. Uh, I'm currently in our Colorado office, and uh, we also have a Puerto Rico office as well. And we specialize in uh, tax strategies and also what I call wealth efficiency strategies. Um, we like a lot of uh, tax-free vehicles. I'm a big fan of Roth for that uh, for that. Uh, tax-free nature that it gives you. I actually have a book on Amazon, uh, specifically on Roth strategies that uh, you may want to check out. And then today we're going to be looking specifically at uh, a life insurance strategy, which is a combination tax-free vehicle and wealth efficiency strategy. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, take something away from this and uh, maybe it'll get you a little bit excited as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that is one thing I want from people is to kind of just a lot of people don't even know what's possible uh, with your money, whether it be tax strategies or different investment strategies or things like that. So um, hopefully this whets the appetite of people uh, to kind of start looking into some other things. And I definitely do recommend Will's book to Roths for the Rich. Uh, very good read. Even if you aren't able to apply the things in it, it just helps you understand taxes and how how the finances work. Um, so really, uh, really helpful book. So Will, do you want to kind of just go into it and just kind of talk about how this strategy works, um, who it's intended for, who it might benefit, and then we'll kind of close with how people can get involved if they'd like to. Sounds great. So um, I personally believe that taxes are the single biggest obstacle to building wealth. And so from that foundational belief, I help create strategies to reduce or even eliminate uh, taxation on various investments and savings vehicles. Um, the particular strategy we're going to talk about today is uh, something that I've coined the term the bank replacement strategy. And that's, a, that's an important term uh, because this particular strategy is going to sound like something you may have heard of before, but it's really very different. And so I want to make sure that there's that distinction there. But the other important kind of thing, we'll start big picture and then we'll dial into the details, is that the bank replacement strategy is meant to be an alternative to a bank savings account. It is not meant to be an alternative to an investment or a business or something else that you want to do with your money. So I, I always like to start out because people, especially probably your audience, James, are, are researchers and they're innovative and they're always looking for kind of the next big thing. And so it's possible that they've come across various life insurance strategies that might sound like what I'm going to present. But I want to just kind of say here at the beginning 
that if you are familiar with strategies like uh, infinite banking or bank on yourself or becoming your own banker or something along those lines, what I'm going to be describing today is actually very different from those strategies. Um, what makes it different? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about. But the big thing is, is that I actually tried those strategies. I've been involved kind of in this space for over a decade now. And I think that those particular strategies have uh, certain issues with them, pitfalls, if you will, and, and even problems just to call it what it is. And I think we have created something superior to those. And I think we've actually solved the inherent problems with those particular strategies. So keep that in the back of your mind. If you've heard of those before, if you've tried them, if you've researched them, et cetera, if you haven't ever heard of those, then that's fine. Uh, you're, you're kind of a, a blank slate here and uh, you'll be able to uh, catch up and, and pick up what I'm uh, talking about rather quickly. So let's just kind of start with what I see most people do. And what I see most people do is they utilize a bank savings account as a place to kind of store their cash. It's, it's a, an account that they use for monies that they want to be liquid, that they want to be accessible, and that they want to be safe. And so it's kind of a home base, if you will, for many people financially. Now, it does serve uh, and, and it does, you know, have the purpose of giving you access to your funds. We can access money in our bank account relatively quickly. I think a lot of people would be surprised that if you actually want to take uh, funds out of your bank account, uh, at least significant funds, it's a little bit harder than uh, you might think, but within a few days in worst case scenario. So it's, it's liquid. It's accessible. It's also safe, right? Um, I was watching uh, one of your recent videos, James, and you were talking about FDIC insurance. And so that's insurance that people have with a bank account. And so that particular insurance helps people feel like, hey, my money's safe in the bank. It's not you know, in the stock market where I'm going to wake up one day and everything's kind of crashing all around me and I'm losing money. So it does help solve uh, a lot of the issues that people are looking for it to solve. But here's the million dollar question. Is it the best place to put money that you want to be liquid and accessible and safe? And I think the answer is possibly not. Maybe there is a better solution. You see, most people don't get excited about putting funds, especially significant amounts into a bank account because they're just really not getting uh, that many benefits. You know, the banks for years, I even remember this as, as a child, uh, have, have enticed us to open new accounts by, you know, giving us rewards like uh, a free toaster or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's what I got from my first bank account. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, that, that, that goes away quickly, the excitement over that, over that free gift. And then after that, there might be some interest, but, you know, if we look back over the last five, 10 years or so, that interest is usually pennies. And we find out what it is when we get an INT tax form. And that's when we realize how little we're actually receiving uh, in interest in our bank accounts. And so what I've seen because of kind of the unique perspective that I have and kind of how I like to look at how the world works is I see that banks are really the ones that are winning with our savings accounts. What do I mean by this? Well, we save and we put money into these uh, savings accounts in the bank and they pay us, you know, 1% interest or less oftentimes. And uh, we all sign up for that program. <laughs> we don't really get many other benefits. Meanwhile, what is the bank doing? Well, the bank is actually taking those dollars and they are investing them. They're lending them out. And so they're earning, you know, many times more than 1% on those funds. And uh, that sounds like a good deal, right? If somebody would give you money and uh, say, hey, you only have to give me 1% on this money and you can go earn whatever you want. I think a lot of us would take, take that offer up. And so that's exactly what 
uh, banks are doing. Now it gets more complicated than that. We don't have to get into that today because the banks are allowed to do a lot of interesting things like fractional reserve banking and lend out money they don't really have on hand, et cetera. But the reality is if we take a look at banks and instead of making them the enemy, we say, okay, what, what does a bank actually do? What, what are they in the business of? <laughs> and they're in the business of making money. It's one of the interesting things when we think about that's what banks do. They're in the business of making money. And so let's look at what banks do and say, okay, they're probably really good at this. Uh, the banking industry has been around for who knows how long. Let's actually look at what they're doing and see if we can't replicate what they're doing or uh, implement some of the uh, things that they do in our own personal financial systems, even though they're much smaller than a bank's would be. And that's kind of the road we're going to head down today. So as James mentioned, this is a life insurance strategy. Now let's talk about why. Why life insurance? Well, to start, life insurance is tax-free. And that's very significant. Uh, life insurance is tax-free. Now there's some, some rules and regulations and, and things you have to follow in order to keep the tax-free nature of life insurance, but the government has stipulated pretty much as clear as possible that as long as you follow the rules, you're going to have ta tax-free uh, treatment of life insurance. Now, some people might be tuning in and, and saying, wait, I don't understand. It, do I have to die for, for these tax benefits? And the answer to that is no. So quickly, I, I'd like to just describe the difference between uh, what I would call, you know, term life insurance and then permanent life insurance because they're very, very different. And so if you're only familiar with term life insurance, that's more of your pure insurance. So for example, you probably have, you know, auto insurance, you probably have homeowners insurance, you might have an umbrella policy. Those are, those are what I would call more pure insurance. And what do I mean by that? Those insurance policies normally require something essentially very negative to happen in your life where you then have to file a claim for then you to benefit financially from having that insurance. So for example, you know, you're, you're not going to receive too many benefits from an auto insurance policy unless you're actually in an auto accident. None of us want to be in an auto accident. Uh, your homeowner's policy, you know, you're not really going to benefit too much from that policy. But if your house burns down, then you're going to receive some sort of a lump sum payment in order to rebuild your house. And again, we don't want our house to build down, burn down. And so with the term life insurance side, which we're not really going to be focused on today, yes, that type of a life insurance policy to benefit from that means you pretty much have to die. And then your beneficiary receives the death benefit. And in that situation, that would be tax-free, meaning the beneficiaries would not owe income tax on that death benefit. There's actually another type of life insurance over here called permanent life insurance. That's what we're going to be focused on today. So if you want to try to remember the difference, term insurance is temporary, meaning they're only going to give you a policy that has a level premium for a certain number of years. Usually it's 10, 15, or 20 years. And then over here, we're talking about permanent life insurance, which means your death benefit assuming the policy stays in force, is permanent, meaning it will pay a death benefit essentially no matter how long you live. And can, so, I ask a, can I ask a quick question for you? Please uh, do. Just because I know we have a lot of people uh, that are not in the U.S. This is a U.S. only thing. Is that correct? Is, does life insurance function the same way in Canada or the rest of the world? Or is this, no, this is only U.S. If you're not U.S., you can learn a little bit about the U.S., but this isn't going to help you very much. Yeah, Fantastic. Everything we're going to be talking about today is going to be U.S. only. And the reason why is because of the special tax treatment in the Internal Revenue Code afforded life insurance for uh, U.S. citizens. So I, I actually don't know how life insurance works in other various countries. It's possible there are similar benefits, but it's hard enough to keep up with all of the legislative right. changes in the U.S. So that's where I keep my focus. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Just wanted to verify that before we kept going. So thank you. Yep, absolutely. So on the permanent life insurance side, um, the life insurance policies, there, there's different variations of them. You, you might hear of uh, life insurance called whole life. You might hear of life insurance called universal life. 
Uh, there's variable life insurance. There's index life insurance. There's all kinds, right? All of those that I just named usually fall into the category of permanent life insurance. Today, we're just going to focus on one, which is whole life insurance. That's not to say the others are bad, but this particular strategy works best, in my opinion, with whole life insurance. And so whole life insurance, generally speaking, is going to have a cash value to it. And that's going to be the key to this particular strategy working out. Again, when you have pure insurance, you almost never have a cash value. It's just insurance. You pay premiums. You hope nothing bad happens to you because you never really do want to file for a claim. And so that's just kind of money lost. Well, on the whole life insurance side, as you fund the policy, which is traditionally referred to as premiums, we like to call them contributions for our particular strategy, as you'll see why, um, those start to build up a cash value in the policy. And that is a cash value that can benefit you while you're living. Everything we're going to talk about today, with the exception of the death benefit, is all going to be benefits that you can take advantage of while you're living. This isn't a strategy that you need to pass away for in order to take advantage of. Now, this particular cash value uh, can be borrowed against. It can be leveraged in order to do other things. And that's kind of the nature of the bank replacement strategy. Now, a couple things for those of you that are familiar with life insurance strategies that maybe have researched this, read books, heard about it, or tried it. There's some key differences here that I want to set the stage for right off the bat. Number one, um, not all life insurance companies are created equal. Uh, there, there's very different companies out there, different sizes, different types. And so we're talking about a very unique niche, a subset of life insurance companies, if you will. And that's key to making this particular strategy work. So I'm going to start by separating uh, life insurance companies into two types. You've got stock life insurance companies, and then you have mutual life insurance companies. There are other types, for example, fraternal life insurance companies, but that's so minor, it's not really going to help the conversation. Most life, most life insurance companies and most insurance companies in general are stock insurance companies, which essentially means they're owned by the shareholders. This particular strategy is not going to work with a stock insurance company. So we're going to come over here and we're going to look at this small section of life insurance companies called mutual life insurance companies. The strategy works with these companies. Why? Mutual life insurance companies are owned by the policyholders. Why is that important? Well, because that means that profits that are made by the insurance company on an annual basis can then be allocated and paid to the owners of the company, which happen to be the policyholders. And so this is a way for us to actually earn money on the money on the cash value that we have inside of the policy. Now, once you know, and, that, and for most of you, this is probably the first time you're hearing the difference between a stock insurance company and a mutual insurance company. Once you know that this particular strategy works well with a mutual life insurance company, that's not the end of the story. So you don't want to just quickly rush out, find out a company is a mutual insurance company and dive in head first. We're now going to take these mutual life insurance companies. And we're going to separate them into two groups. And by the way, we're not talking about a lot of insurance companies here. There's about two dozen mutual life insurance companies in this country. And we're going to now take them and separate them into two groups over here. You've got what's called direct recognition mutual life insurance companies. And then over here, you have non-direct recognition mutual life insurance companies. This is a key distinction, and you have to understand this. And sadly, most people don't know this. What's fascinating is they could go and obtain a policy from either company, go through the entire process, and not find out or ever be told which type of a company it is. And as you probably know, with various strategies, the devil's in the details. That could not be more true here. So I'm going to start with direct recognition life insurance companies and explain what that means. What does this term direct recognition mean? Well, that's a legal term. And it means that if you have a life insurance policy, a permanent life insurance policy over here with a direct recognition mutual life insurance company, and you actually want to utilize and borrow against the cash value of the policy to do other things, whether it's crypto or investments or businesses, they're going to directly recognize the fact that you are utilizing the cash value of the policy 
and they're going to change your return on the policy. And so that's interesting. I personally believe that life insurance companies who are direct recognition set that up to benefit the insurance company and not you as the policyholder. And so for that reason, we don't do this strategy with direct recognition uh, life insurance companies. And by the way, it's not easy to figure out what a company is. We, we've had people tell us stories that I'll never forget where they actually called the life insurance company and asked using this terminology. And the first person they got on the phone had never even heard of it. So just kind of keep that in mind. Figuring this out is not easy, but uh, we've done the homework and we're happy to share our findings with you. So now we're going to come over here. This is the group of mutual life insurance companies called non-direct recognition life insurance companies. And as you probably are starting to figure out, they do not recognize policy owners who have leveraged or borrowed against their cash value. So what does that mean? That means that whether you leveraged your life insurance policy in a given policy year or not, your return, uh, whether it's a dividend or a cash value increase, is going to stay the same. And so this to me is way more transparent, way more clear, and it's going to make this particular strategy we're talking about today, the bank replacement strategy, work way more efficiently. So now that we kind of have all of that set up, let's talk about a few more things that I think are super important. For this particular strategy to work, we want something that looks similar to a bank account. We want something that has this the safety that we believe a bank account gives us. And then we want something that's going to give us a higher return than we're accustomed to receiving in a bank account. And so again, here is where the uh, devil is in the details and why so many of these details matter. So again, hopefully this information is very helpful. Let's say you learned today the difference between stock and mutual companies. Then you learn the difference between direct recognition and non-direct recognition. Just going to a non-direct recognition mutual life insurance company is also not going to get you exactly what you want or what you need. Uh, for this particular strategy to work. And so now we're going to talk about policy design. And this is super key here. And this is kind of really now what really separates what we do at our company from other people that do this across the country. Um, number one, people like to ask a lot about the costs and the fees with life insurance. Completely fair question. I'm going to tell you today the number one cost, what I would say is the biggest cost in life insurance that you will never hear, at least to my knowledge, anywhere else. I've read a lot of books, watched a lot of videos, and attended a lot of presentations, and I never hear this stated. The number one cost with life insurance is actually lost opportunity cost. What do I mean by this? I mean, if you put money into a life insurance policy, and this guy who's you know, explaining this policy to you tells you you're not going to have access to your money for one, two, three, four, five years, however long it is, you have now something that's very real, which is called lost opportunity cost. And what that is, is if you have an opportunity come to you in, in your situation, you can't take advantage of it with the money that you put into the life insurance policy that you don't have access to. That's your biggest cost because whatever return that is, you're going to lose that because you don't have the ability to take advantage of it. That's the biggest piece here. And so I've seen countless life insurance policies that people bring to me, either that they're being pitched or that they already own, and they just don't have access to their money. And they're just waiting and waiting and waiting to get access to it. Meanwhile, missing out on opportunities. And so that's your biggest cost. And so what we've done is we've said, okay, we understand this. We understand how all of this works. And we know that the lost opportunity cost piece is a big deal. And so we've said, okay, how can we eliminate that or minimize it as much as possible? And here's how we've done that. We have found a particular life insurance chassis. It's, it's in the whole life space, but it's a very unique chassis that was actually created for buy-sell agreements. You don't even need to know what that is because we use this for a very different purpose. But we've, we found this chassis that has the ability 
with a, a, a rider that we add to it to give you 90% liquidity of the money that you fund the policy with. And that liquidity is not available a year from now or two years from now. It's available the next day. So you fund this particular life insurance policy. The next day, you have access to 90% of what you put into it. Now, there's going to be some rare circumstances just to kind of you know, set expectations here whether maybe somebody has health issues or maybe somebody is, you know, on the older side of the spectrum where we, we won't quite hit that 90% number, but we're going to be close. The lowest I usually see in our practice, and we've done this hundreds of times is like 88 or 89%. This is significant liquidity. Now, this is the most important piece in my opinion, because again, we want to make sure we're not tying up your money for long periods of time, not giving you access to it for when you need it. You'd always, you don't always know when opportunities are going to fall on, in your lap and you need to make sure that you, that you are able to take advantage of those and do them in the right time that you need to do them for. So that's key. Now, circling back real quick to what I said at the beginning, these other strategies that you may have heard of that are similar but different, like infinite banking and becoming your own banker, they're utilizing a rider in their strategies to help increase the liquidity in the life insurance. But what I see is that they're usually only increasing the liquidity to maybe 50, 60, or 70% of what you put into the life insurance policy. We still haven't found anyone else in the country that's able to give what we're giving, which is 90% liquidity on day one. Super, super important. Because again, if this is going to be a bank replacement strategy. We want something that looks similar and feels similar to a bank account. And with a bank account, you don't put money into it and have to wait a year or two to have access to it. So that's, that's super important. I want people to really understand that. Um, the next thing I want to cover is there, there will be a death benefit with this policy. This is actually life insurance and legally it has to be life insurance to get the tax benefits afforded life insurance inside of the tax code. And so that death benefit has value. Uh, a lot of you may already have life insurance policies. Maybe you have term life insurance and you're paying a monthly premium or an annual premium for, for that death benefit. Well, by switching over to this strategy, assuming the death benefit is what you want and need for your family, and maybe it's equal to or greater than what you already have over here with term life insurance, you can actually, if you choose, get rid of that term life insurance because you now have the coverage you and your family need on this side. And that's actually additional savings because you're not putting it into that policy without knowing whether or not you're going to pass away in that time frame or not. So that's, that's a, that's a second added benefit to this particular life insurance strategy is that death benefit. Now, the last piece I want to talk about is actually maybe the most complicated but it's also something that everybody asks. And so I like to cover it up front. And that is the return. So <clears throat> life insurance, as I mentioned, on the mutual whole life space, they pay dividends uh, based on profitability that they have. They pay an annual dividend to policyholders. Now, the dividend is not guaranteed. There are various guarantees you get with life insurance, but the dividend is not one of them. And so understanding that is important. And then understanding the track record of the insurance company and their dividend payments is very, very important. The dividend is declared annually by each insurance company, usually around November or December for the next year. And so we are working with life insurance companies that have paid dividends for 150 years in a row uh, going back into the past. And so these are incredible track records. And because of those track records, the insurance company is highly motivated to keep that up. And so while dividends are not guaranteed, they do everything they can to be as profitable as possible in order to pay a dividend to the policyholders. Because remember, in the mutual life insurance space, the policyholders own the company. And so therefore, that is our share of the profits of the company. That dividend is going to go into the policy and it's going to represent a portion of the gains in the cash value of the policy. And so big picture, if the uh, return on the life insurance policy, which is being driven largely by the dividend, can outrun a bank account, then in my opinion, this is a winning strategy. And it's probably not that hard to fathom. 
uh, a life insurance policy outrunning a bank account, especially when we look at the last 10 years and the abysmal numbers uh, being paid into our bank savings accounts. Now, returns are going to be largely based on your health. And so this isn't a one size fits all where everybody's going to get the same return. <clears throat> there is underwriting, as you would expect with life insurance. And the healthier you are, the, the better returns you're going to have in the policy. Okay. No, this is making a lot of sense. And just so people know too, I've gone through this process and I have have my life insurance set up and I've taken out loan uh, on that and have received the dividend, all these things. So I've everything that Will's talking about, I've been through it all and it's worked exactly like he's describing it so far. So I can vouch for that. So thank you. Awesome. All right. So <clears throat> The uh, what I tell people because the, the returns are difficult, right? We all know that past performance is not indicative of future results. We all get that. And so it's no different in the life insurance space. And so what we do is we say, OK, looking back at what's happened, looking at where things are today and kind of, you know, looking at some projections, I believe it's a safe uh, estimate that if you're healthy, that you will have around a five to a six percent internal rate of return on the life insurance policy over your lifetime, over the long haul. And so let's talk about that because what if it ends up being less than that? Well, even if it ends up being less than that, that is still superior to a bank account. And not only that, let's not forget that the life insurance is tax-free, right? The bank savings account is not tax-free. And so when we take into consideration a 5% tax-free return against, let's let's go aggressive here and say a 2% taxable bank account, it's still going to end up over double uh, return on the life insurance side. And so I do believe this particular strategy has very few risks associated with it. And I believe for most people, assuming they're insurable and they're savers and investors is going to be a strategy that they're going to be able to implement and it's going to create value, added value that they would not have without it. And let, let me just be clear on one thing. This is not a strategy that has to really replace anything that you're currently doing. We, we look at this as an and asset, not an or asset, meaning you don't have to say, okay, I've got X dollars and I was going to put them over here, but now I've got to put them in the life insurance policy. No. This is a bank replacement strategy, just like you would normally take funds and set them in a bank account. And that would be your holding tank before you deploy it into whatever you're looking to do. You're now going to replace that bank savings account with a life insurance policy. Now you're going to fund the life insurance policy and it's going to sit in there until you're ready to deploy it into the things that you are going to do anyway. So in reality, this strategy should not prevent you from investing or pursuing whatever it is you are going to do anyway. All it's going to do is give you an asset that's going to give you more benefits and more tax-free uh, growth than you would get with a bank savings account. And so if everything works out, uh, what, what you're going to end up with is you're going to you know, go down the road. You've had your policy for years. You've been you know, saving into it. You've been borrowing against it. You're now going to have an extra asset that you wouldn't have if you just use a bank account throughout your whole life. And so the people that are just kind of doing what everybody else is doing, saving into a banking bank account, taking the money out and putting it into investments, you're now going to have this second asset, which is a life insurance policy. The cash value has just been growing and growing and growing. And remember with non-direct recognition, even when you're borrowing against it, you're still getting dividends if they're declared and you're still getting cash value growth. So now you get to some future time time frame where you're ready to, you know, just kind of live off of passive cash flow only. You're now going to have this life insurance policy with this cash value that you can then take tax free income from as well that you wouldn't have had uh, if you just utilized a bank account. So that's essentially the strategy in a nutshell. And uh, James, if there's any questions, more than happy to answer those while we're here. Yeah, no, thank you. It's very, for some people, like I remember when I first heard about this, I was kind of, my mind was blown. Like I had never thought about money in this way. So sometimes it takes a little bit to get your mind wrapped around it. Um, one question, what kind of net worth makes sense to do this? Like if you only have a thousand dollars sitting around, 
does it make sense to go through all this process and set that up? Or what's kind of the minimum that you would recommend starting to get something like this set up? Yeah, that's a great question. So that that's not, it's not the easiest to answer, but we've been asked it so many times we have uh, figured out a good answer for, for people to just kind of know if this is something that they should, you know, take the next step and look into or not. And I would say this at a, at a bare minimum for this particular strategy, you're going to want to fund that life insurance policy with a minimum of about $10,000 per year. So I think that's kind of a safe number. And if somebody's like, Hey, I could easily do that, or I could do much more. I think it's worth looking into, but if that's like kind of really pushing the budget and straining somebody, it's probably something they should, they should wait on. Okay. And they could always, you know, talk, have a talk with you to see if their situation would make sense for what they're doing. And sometimes it wouldn't, sometimes, you know, what they're looking for is not going to match up, but it doesn't hurt to talk necessarily. Yeah, we've uh-huh. got a we've, we've got a very big team, and uh, when when people you know reach out to us, we connect them with someone on the team to kind of go over their financial situation, answer some questions, and just kind of try to figure out right at the outset if it's if it's something worth pursuing or not. Gotcha. And Chris said uh, you assist with taxes as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So great catch on that. Um, I'm an enrolled agent. For those of you who don't know what that is. Um, it's actually the highest uh, designation that the IRS awards someone who can do tax planning, who can do tax strategies, and who can actually, if it comes to this, represent clients in front of the IRS for uh, you know tax issues. And so, yes, we have a specific tax planning arm of our business, and uh, that particular tax planning arm does not do what people are used to, which is just tax returns and bookkeeping and accounting. We don't do any of that. We, we simply focus on tax strategies and try to create as much value for people as possible, literally using the tax code to their advantage. Gotcha. Yeah. And I just wanted another shout out. So my local tax person that I use had not heard of some of the strategies that Will introduced me to. And so I've been taking these tax strategies to him you can say, oh, that's that's brilliant. I should start using that with my other customers. So these are not tax strategies that everyone knows. Don't think that all tax preparers uh, are created alike because that's not the truth. Um, Kordamai would like to know, how are these life insurance companies generating the dividends? Yeah, fantastic question. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer you by talking about actually all insurance companies, not just life insurance companies. So a lot of people don't know this, but insurance companies are essentially making money off of what's called the float. And the float is they're taking all of these premiums in. So just think of, you know, Geico or State Farm, for example. They're taking in all of these premiums from all these people, from you and from me, on our cars, on our homes, and they don't just put it in the bank, right? They don't just sit on it and, 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 you know, wait and see if you get into a car accident or if your house burns down. They're actually investing that money. And so they know that this is a field actually of science known as actuarial science. They know with law of large numbers that not everybody's going to get into a car accident every day. Not everybody's house is going to burn down every day. And so they can kind of play those numbers to their advantage, keep some money liquid to pay claims, but then the rest, the, the, the lion's share, if you will, they can actually invest. And so that is how insurance companies make money. It's why Warren Buffett uh, was so interested in in Geico is he wanted to be able to invest that float money. Now on the life insurance side specifically, they're not really that different from other insurance companies. They're doing the exact same thing. They're taking all of these premiums in, they're keeping some, you know, in in reserves which the the government actually regulates. They have to keep a certain amount and they're investing the rest. But on the life insurance side, there is one other piece which is the uh, what's called mortality uh, experience is what it's called, mortality experience. And so if an insurance company does a really good job in the underwriting phase and accurately says, you know, this many people are going to live to life expectancy, this many people are going to exceed it, and this many people are going to pass away before life expectancy, if they do a good job on that or even exceed what they were predicting, that is actually additional profit. Because the insurance companies are expecting a certain number of people to die prematurely. And they're expecting a certain number of people to live longer. And so 
when those uh, don't happen, meaning people live longer than they were predicting, that's actually an additional uh, profit source for the insurance company. And so if you kind of take all of that together, there's other things uh, just because I'm kind of, I kind of nerd out on this, but it, most insurance, if you go check this for yourself, if you're paying it monthly, you're actually paying an additional fee. And what we've found in our experience is most people don't even know that. Uh, but you, if you pay annually and you do the math, what you were paying times 12 and what it would be to pay annually, it's a lot less to pay annually. And so there's a lot of different fees and things built in uh, throughout uh, throughout the process. And, and just lastly, I'll also say this, let's not forget that insurance companies are profitable by their very nature. Mathematically, just for easy numbers, they're taking $3 in in premiums and they're only paying out $1 in claim. And so when somebody buys that term life insurance policy that we talked about, that temporary life insurance, and they live to the end of 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, and that policy goes away, all of that was essentially pure profit for the insurance company. Nope. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And quarter mile wants to know, what are they investing in? Yes. Um, yeah, and that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. So it's really, it's actually a really good question. So, uh, every insurance company kind of has their own thing, things that they're doing. Like for example, they're not all investing in exactly the same things, but what you're going to find generally speaking is that life insurance companies in particular <clears throat> are investing in bonds. Uh, they're investing in investment grade bonds. Insurance companies think long term. They think 50 and 100 years in advance. And so when interest rates are high, they'll actually try to obtain longer term bonds. And when interest rates are low, they'll try to get as short term as possible. And so when interest rates came down, you know, a decade ago or whatever, insurance companies still had on their books double digit interest coming in from bonds that they uh, from long term bonds that they obtained when interest rates were high. Now you're going to find, and by the way, this is public record. You can look up what an insurance company is invested in. You're going to notice some real estate uh, with insurance companies, uh, which I think is, is good and fantastic. Th there is one insurance company and it's the only one that I know of. And I think they, they might be the only one that does this, but there is an insurance company that also invests in businesses. And so that aligns with me because I think businesses are possibly the highest return many people will have throughout their life. And so if you want to look up this life insurance company, I won't tell you who it is, but I will tell you about one of their transactions and you can look it up that way. But there was a life insurance company that purchased Oppenheimer funds. Most people have heard of Oppenheimer funds. They may or may not have heard of the insurance company, but they purchased Oppenheimer funds for around $400 million. And they ended up selling it for many billions of dollars uh, about three years ago. And so that is another place where, you know, an investment in the general portfolio of the insurance company created profits for the uh, policyholders. Okay, very good. And what's the range of the dividends you usually see? Um, I think my, I think uh, the one that we're using, I, I think was 6.3% is something like that. But what's the ranges that you usually see? So the dividend rate, uh, which is declared annually by the insurance companies, those, those right now vary between four and 6%. Um, what I have personally, and what you have, James, is, is, is at the high end of that, which is at the 6.0%. Something to keep in mind, because I just want people to understand this. The more you understand it, the better off you'll be. The dividend rate that the insurance company declares is the same rate for all the policyholders, but the performance of the policy is actually based on which life insurance chassis you have and how it's designed. And so your own personal IRR, if you will, which I think might be the most important number to, to think about and look at is going to be based on how we design your policy. And then, as I mentioned before, it's also going to be based on your health. The healthier you are, the better the policy will perform. Okay. And then uh, do you see as, uh, as interest rates are going up, are the interest rates on the loans that you're taking that are collateralized, are those rates going up as well? Yes, they are. So, um, the best way for people to understand this is if you're familiar with a HELOC, so a home equity line of credit, when, when you go out and get a mortgage, most people are getting 30 year mortgages and they, and they understand that usually it's fixed. It's a fixed interest rate for 30 years. That's a good thing. 
But then when you go and you get a line of credit, which is now going to be similar to the life insurance strategy, those HELOCs, those home equity lines of credit are variable interest rates and they're tied to different indices. And so right now we've seen the Fed uh, spike interest rates to combat inflation and they've done it over a short period of time. And so we're in this kind of weird uh, place where the insurance policies themselves, which have not seen uh, a loan interest rate increase in over 10 years, are now contractually having to increase because they're based on something like Moody's bond index or whatever. And so the answer is yes, we've seen those go up. And so what's the answer to this? Here's what I would like to say. You never want to look at like a weird, small uh, time frame and make a decision based on that, right? So for example, you know, your audience will probably be able to re relate to this. I'm actually a big altcoin guy. And so right now, altcoins are very low, right? Uh, and so you don't want to look at where it's at now and, and think to yourself, well, that means they're not good to own. Uh, I don't believe that. And so I still own them. And so what we're going to see happen is I think over time, if the interest rates stay high, I think we're going to see the insurance companies actually raise the dividend because they don't want to be in a situation where the loan rate is higher than the dividend rate. We're also proactively for our clients going out and we're talking to banks and we're saying, hey, here's a unique opportunity where if you will give our clients a line of credit against their life insurance policy, we can show the banks why it's secured via the life insurance policy and to give us a better rate than they can currently get with the life insurance policy uh, company itself. And so we're in this kind of weird place. The dividend rate is still higher than the loan rate as of today, but we're always looking to create as much positive arbitrage as possible. Okay, very cool. Um, and then is, is this insured? Is, you know, anything to protect against, you know, the insurance company becoming insolvent? I mean, in crypto, we're used to that happening everywhere. So we want to just ask about that for sure. Yeah. So life insurance is not FDIC insured. And I'm going to show my true colors here a little bit. Um, I actually personally, so this isn't advice. I personally don't put a lot of stock in FDIC insurance. And if you ever want to take a rabbit trail, go research that because I think what you might find is that the money's not there to cover that insurance. But with that said, even though life insurance is not FDIC insured, there are state guarantee associations which step in if a life insurance company ever goes out of business. And I will tell you from a, from a historical standpoint and from a track record standpoint, um, you, you will almost never find a situation where an insurance company went out of business and because they went out of business, people lost money. Here's what you normally see. You normally see another insurance company assume the, the business, the life insurance policies that that insurance company had, therefore preserving uh, those policies, or you'll see some sort of a payout uh, or the state guarantee association stepping in and helping make policy holders whole. What I will tell you is that the size of the life insurance company that you're dealing with is important if you're concerned, and I think you should be, of a potential insolvency of an insurance company. In the past, um, I personally did business with some small to medium sized insurance companies, and one of them actually did something called demutualized. They went from being a mutual company to a stock company, and that was messy. And so one thing I've learned, I try to learn from my own mistakes so that you guys can learn from my mistakes. You don't have to make them yourselves is you want to deal with large insurance companies that are over a hundred years old, reducing the chances of something like that happening in your lifetime. Okay. Nope. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and then just to verify, um, so quarter by to note, you can withdraw the policy before death and you can't withdraw, correct? But you could take out a collateralized, a loan collateralized by that. Or do you want to talk into that? Yeah. Yeah. Technically you could withdraw it. I don't think that makes a lot of sense, but to answer your question, uh, you're going to have access to the cash value before your death. You're not going to have access to say the entire death benefit. That is what's paid upon death. But the cash value, which comes from our design, number one, the rider we use, and then you funding it, that cash value is going to continue to grow. You're going to get an annual dividend if it's declared. You're going to get guaranteed cash value growth each year. 
And so that cash value is what you have access to. It's what goes on your balance sheet. And it's what you should look at as another bank account, so to speak. And so it should go on your balance sheet. Here's how much money I have. And here's how much I have access to. And the best way, in my opinion, to access the, the value, the cash value of the policy is to borrow against it, right? And so again, so many people are familiar with real estate. Not, not so many people are familiar intimately with life insurance. So I like to use the real estate example. If you want to access equity in your home, you could sell it. That'd be kind of like a withdrawal. You don't really want to do that because you live there, let's say. And so you go to the bank and you get a line of credit. You get a HELOC, a home, equ home equity line of credit. Now you're able to utilize the equity. Your home is still appreciating in value, assuming that the real estate market is going up, but you're now leveraging or tapping into the equity in order to invest in other things. That is what you would do with the life insurance policy as well. You'd borrow against it. Yep. And that's it. what I did immediately is we did a, a writer to get it funded. <laughs> then I immediately took out as much as I could to put in my other investments. Um, so basically, I just have a little bit of a return and a life insurance policy um, basically for free is kind of how it ended up working out. Um, do you want to, uh, are, can you talk about the tax advantages of this policy? Yes, for sure. So when it comes to tax free, <laughs> there's not many things that, that, you know, tax attorneys or even the government itself will just flat out refer to as tax free. But life insurance is one of those. So quick history lesson, life insurance predates the tax code. I believe the Internal Revenue Code was uh, implemented in 1913. Uh, life insurance, like the type we're talking about, goes back into the 1800s. And so when the Internal Revenue Code was written, they actually had to figure out what to do with these existing vehicles. And they made the decision to make life insurance tax free. Now, when I tell you why they did this, it's going to make complete sense. And the government has written this down. So I'm essentially just passing on their information. The government understands and realizes that if life insurance is not tax-free, people are going to be less inclined to buy life insurance and therefore have a way to take care of their family if someone, especially the breadwinner of the family, passes away prematurely. And so the government knows when people are in dire straits financially, they go to the government. And so the government has to find money to pay for that. So they've literally said, life insurance is tax-free because we want to encourage people to take care of their own families. And so that if somebody does happen to pass away, who was making significant amount of money to pay the bills, a lump sum of money would come into them income tax-free so they can continue to survive. And so when I say that life insurance is tax-free, I mean tax-free. I mean there is no forms that are going to be sent to you like a 1099. There's no forms that are going to be sent to the IRS. And so you don't have anything that goes on a tax return. You're not going to find a line on the, on the tax return that said, what were your gains in your life insurance policy this, this year? Because none of that is reported in such a way. And so your annual gains in your life insurance policy are completely tax-free. Um, the, when you borrow against it, that's tax-free. And that's actually you don't, that's actually borrowing from the tax code of debt, right? That's why mortgages and cash out refis and home equity lines of credit are tax-free. It's the same thing. And then the death benefit is also tax-free as well. Now, to be clear, this is income tax-free. It's capital gains tax-free, but it's not estate tax-free. To help create uh, an estate tax-free situation with life insurance requires some creative trust work, but that's doable as well. Okay. Very good. And that's one thing I've found is there's always the, the tax, there's always ways to move the tax code around, massage it, um, to do different things. Um, is this the same as indexed whole life insurance or is that something else? Um, it, it's definitely different. So, um, I, I don't want to put any words into whoever asked this question. I want to put any words into their mouth because indexed whole life actually exists but it's so rare when I hear that term, it's usually referring to indexed universal life. So I'll just quickly touch on both. Um, universal life is wildly different from whole life. Indexed universal life is by far the most popular indexed strategy. Um, and what that is, is that that particular policy, you can index your return to the stock market. 
and you can do it in such a way where you can design it in such a way where if the stock market is down, your policy doesn't get any return, but it also doesn't go down by the percentage of the stock market de decrease. And then those policies can be designed where if the stock market is up, you can have a return either similar to that upside or possibly uncapped with the whole upside. Indexed universal life insurance, I think is an interesting vehicle. I personally own it and I like it, but it's not good in my opinion for the bank replacement strategy that we're talking about. Now with indexed whole life, which is incredibly rare, um, I don't like that for this particular strategy either. For the bank replacement strategy, again, we're looking for something that's going to be superior to a bank account. Even though we're getting a small return in our bank accounts, our bank savings accounts, we still want to get a return every single year. We want to make sure that we have consistent growth while we're funding it. And with an indexed whole life policy, there can be years where you have little to no return. Okay, gotcha. Um, do any loans you take against the policy affect the dividends that you earn? Cool. So Chris, uh, thank you for the question. And it's a really good question. The answer is no with an asterisk. And that is with our strategy. Okay. So going back to the direct recognition and non-direct recognition, we only use non-direct recognition, which means that when you're borrowing against the policy, it is not changing the dividend or the performance of, of your policy. It, in the direct rec recognition situation, it is. And so sadly, when people are obtaining a policy, <clears throat> they've never borrowed against it. And so they don't see that there's going to be a change. They look at all these numbers and all these numbers look great, but they don't realize, hey, when you borrow against that, the returns are not going to be what they showed you they're going to be. And I think that's unfair. So with us, yes, absolutely. You can borrow against it and it won't affect those dividends. Okay. And then I don't believe so, but are the contributions to pay for the policy also tax-free? No. <clears throat> Great question. So with the exception of an HSA, health savings account, I don't know of anything where the government allows you to get a tax deduction and then grow it tax-free. And so like a Roth, like honestly, whatever you buy, like if you just go buy crypto or you go buy real estate, you pay taxes on the money, right? It's post-tax dollars. This is also post-tax dollars, but then you're going to get the tax-free growth. Gotcha. Well, hey, this has been awesome. Uh, last question and by far the most important question. Uh, I bet you this guy is not wearing pants. Um, <laughs> do you wear pants to the eye? You look like you're in your office, so <laughs> I'm guessing that you are fully clothed. Okay, you're wrong, Alif. Sorry, man. Appreciate that. <laughs> Um, but Hey, Will, thank you so much for hopping on here again. Part of what I want to do on my channel is help educate people just financially. I'm not really qualified to do that in a lot of these areas. Again, I, it's not fair for me to just hear things from you and then say, I'm like, I know what I'm talking about. So wanted to bring you on. Um, uh, if people are interested in this, want more info, what should they do to kind of get in touch with you? Yeah. The, the best way to get in touch with our team is to shoot an email to info at, duffymethod.com. That's just my last name, D-U-F-F-Y, and then method, M-E-T-H-O-D.com. And uh, you can also check out our website, duffymethod.com, for more information. That's the quickest way to get tapped into us right away. And we can uh, look at your situation and figure out if any of our offerings or strategies make sense in your situation. Okay, very good. Uh, well, thank you, audience. Thank you for your great questions and for listening. Please hit like on your way out. Info at DuffyMethod.com if you would like. Uh, DuffyMethod.com if you just want to read more about Will and what they do there. Um, and Will, thank you so much for hopping on. I'd love to have you back sometime to talk about. I know crypto taxes are you know, killing everybody. And you have other, your Roths for the rich. And you have a lot of different strategies. We could probably do this once a week or so and you'd, there'd be plenty, but I'd love to have you back just for more education. Would love to. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I think this is my last interview of the year. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, 2022. Be Stay tuned for 2023. Appreciate all you guys and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.